In this technical sequence, our program is divided into three segments. The preparatory phases for fabrication of a flexible partial denture, which include design, blocking, and waxing. Our second section will include processing. And our final section will include termination, including finishing and polishing. In this segment, we cover the designing and preparation of flexible partial dentures. The instruments that we will be using are wax spatulas to apply relief and blocking wax, and a red pencil to apply the design onto the stone model. Optimally, in your production environment, this procedure and this step should take a total of five minutes per model. The master model should be prepared from the dentist's mucostatic impression. It is counterindicated to use a compressive impression technique for a flexible denture. We recommend alginate impressions, as these are routinely the most successful. The flexible partial extensions will impinge the tissue if the model is based on a more compressive impression technique. It is not necessary to use a mechanical surveyor for designing a flexible partial denture. Instead, we visually survey the model in order to identify the most aesthetic class placement and to identify two or three points of retention. Because the major connector and the clasps are flexible, we do not need to create an absolute parallel insertion path between the left and the right saddles. First, we will identify any imperfections on the model. These should be removed with a knife or spatula. Once the surface of the model is clean, we can begin the designing of the clasp. We are considering the aesthetics primarily from an anterior point of view. The clasp being designed here is what we call a wraparound clasp. This clasp design is intended to obstruct minimal areas of the tooth surface, exposing a maximum amount of the tooth itself and engaging the undercut primarily on the tissue for retention. On the posterior tooth, we are counterbalancing the wraparound clasp in the anterior retention with a spur. The spur is intended to lock into a small portion of the mesial undercut of the tooth, stabilizing the entire saddle. You'll notice that the flange extension is not as severe as we would expect from a conventional partial denture. Instead, we just follow along the bony structure at its high point to create our periphery edge placement. We also create a little bit of a curvature at the point where the clasp joins the remainder of the saddle. In order to release the vertical axis of flexibility on the clasp and allowing greater flexibility for the clasp itself, we also avoid any impingement of the high point on the tissue as the partial is being inserted. Moving to the palatal surface and lingual aspect of the design, we begin by creating a reciprocal retention on the lingual aspect by the buccal clasp and the buccal formations. You see on the anterior teeth that the design line rests just above the cingulum. This is essential to stabilize the partial against forward movement in the mouth. On the maxillary area, we have a three-quarter or horseshoe palate design. The width of the palate will contribute to how stable the saddle will be. If there are two saddles and a bilateral extension, the saddles need to be stabilized from twisting and rotating independently. The width of the palate will determine the points of flexibility of the saddle and promote a greater stabilization of the entire partial in the mouth. You'll see on the posterior tooth that bears the spur that we have also created reciprocal lingual retention, which should extend at least 180 degrees across the tooth from the retentive device, whether it will be a clasp or a spur. The lingual coverage for posterior teeth should be just above the height of contour on the tooth. And the formation of the partial will follow the contour of the tooth to the palate. Blocking and relieving. Once the design is completely placed on the model using a red pencil, we will begin with wax relief and blocking 
for path of insertion issues, as well as for patient comfort. We begin by visually surveying the undercut on the teeth, which would create a path of insertion obstacle, and we would block these undercuts with wax as necessary for a solid block of material to pass through the respective undercuts, mesially and distally. On this particular model, we see some indication of periodontal pockets and gingival recession lingually. It is not necessary to relieve this area on all cases. We only place relief here if there is a pocket formation. We do not want the appliance itself to model the pocket formations or preserve them. It's important to keep in mind that while flexible, these appliances are not soft or cushiony. It is a hard resin. Any solid formation or non-flexing area of material has to be able to pass through spaces or over a high point without obstruction. The most severe undercut for path of insertion that we can observe on this model is on the posterior tooth bearing the spur. The mesial undercut on this tooth does need to be blocked out to create a vertical wall formation relative to the distal undercut on the abutment tooth to the mesial end of the saddle. Once the path of insertion has been cleared of obstacles due to undercuts on the model, we can begin the process of relieving surfaces which are likely to affect the patient's comfort, not only on insertion and removal of the partial, but also the way it behaves under mastication. One critical relief area is the periphery edge. But importantly, we do not relieve the bulky area of the clasp itself where it has direct contact with the tissue. Very much like a loose shoe would cause irritation on somebody's ankle, a loose clasp on the tissue would cause irritation and abrasion of the tissues. So, it is important to realize that the clasp will be passive. It will not bind on or impinge the tissue. The processed and finished appliance should have a snug fit with the tissue in the tooth areas where it makes contact without being excessively tight or loose. The placement of any wax relief immediately under the clasp will yield a loose fitting appliance in general. We are also relieving the neckline of the tooth to accommodate any visible sign of gingival recession in this area and allow the tissue to regain a normal alignment rather than permitting the partial itself to impinge the tissue where it already shows some sign of recession. In final preparation for duplication of the model, we recommend that the design line be etched into the stone. This creates a visible line on the duplicate model so that the waxer can easily follow the originally intended design. And it will also create a finishing line for the finisher to know exactly at what point to terminate finishing of the periphery edge on the appliance. The posterior edge of the palette should be beaded. If it's a full palette design, we do recommend a conventional post dam, as you would prepare for a conventional full denture. Preparation for waxing. The second office visit for the patient will include a wax try-in with a base plate. The setup will be made on articulated master models and transferred to a duplicate stone model for final waxing and processing. In this case, we use a putty matrix to preserve the exact position of the teeth from the master model and create an accurate transfer to the duplicate model. With the teeth positioned in the matrix, the matrix is positioned on the duplicate model and the teeth are sealed in position over the ridge with wax. Once the teeth are in position on the model and sealed in place, the wax is cooled. We can then prepare the wax surface for a final waxing of the finished partial base material. Ultimately, uniformity and thinness of the waxing are very critical here. So we avoid any areas of excess bulk in our waxing. Our goal in waxing is to preserve the exact form 
of the anatomical contours. The technique of waxing is much closer to that for a metal frame than for waxing an acrylic denture. We rely on the wax up being as close as possible to the finished formation of the partial. And we rely less heavily on finishing in order to create proper anatomy. After placing the teeth on the duplicate model, we must make certain that the underlying anatomical contours are clearly visible and recreated, if necessary, in the wax joining the teeth with the ridge. In order to present a clear guideline for waxing the original design from the master model, we transferred to the duplicate model the original design following the etched line in the stone. Waxing. The instruments and materials that you will need will be wax spatulas. You'll also need a tapered rubber tip like this pencil eraser. The eraser should be tapered in a formation that allows you to press the wax into position. This procedure with a typical case in your production environment will be optimized at around 15 minutes. We strongly recommend the use of proper prefabricated wax patterns to simplify the waxing, expedite the waxing, and make the final wax up more accurate. The wax pattern should have the proper shape and thickness to allow final waxing in one step. Here, we will be using one pattern for the buccal flange area and one pattern for the palate. We begin the waxing with the buccal flange, first softening the wax and then pressing it into position. We align the periphery edge just over the design line. While the wax is still soft, we use the tapered eraser to press the wax pattern cleanly into the contours that we prepared in the underlying surface. In one simple step, we have proper anatomy and proper thickness of our wax buckle flange. The next step in waxing will be to trim the wax pattern to the design line. Then we'll trim the necklines, following the design and preserving harmonious placement of the neckline through the replacement saddle area and the clasp. Once again, aesthetics are going to be our chief guide here, as they were with designing. By using a prefabricated form with identical thickness throughout its length, there is no problem in creating a uniform neckline formation and precision in the anatomy. The final step in preparation of this section will be to seal the wax pattern at all of its contact points, along its periphery edges and along the neckline. Similar to the technique you would follow when waxing, using a prefabricated pattern for a metal frame, it is important not to thin out the pattern by pressing it too heavily, especially when the pattern is still soft. The thickness of the pattern allows for a certain amount of reduction in finishing and polishing. If it is too thin at this stage, there won't be adequate excess that is unavoidably removed in finishing and polishing. The surfaces of the teeth should be completely clean, so there is no waxy residue or wax particles on the facial or occlusal surfaces of the teeth. The finished wax up should have the same underlying contour that we prepared on the surface underneath before applying the wax pattern. To prepare the palatal surface before application of the prefabricated pattern, we flush hot wax over the surface not to create any thickness, but to create a waxy surface that will allow the palate pattern to adapt more readily. Once again, the overriding concept here in waxing, and our goal overall, is to create a uniform thickness of wax that exactly follows the natural underlying anatomical contours, without modifying these contours. Once the surface has been prepared, we use the prefabricated palette pattern. The first step will be to cut a notch into the pattern to allow it to adapt to the type of palatal design that we have. In this case, we have a horseshoe palette. 
The pattern will be softened over the Bunsen burner flame and then pressed into position on the model. Once again, we can use the tapered rubber eraser to press the wax into the contours lingually. Once the pattern is fully adapted to all the anatomical contours, we trim the wax to the height of contour on the posterior teeth. We seal the wax at the contact points and proceed to trim each segment. Systematically working our way around the appliance, we seal and trim the interior area, once again terminating this section just above the cingulum on the anterior teeth, as we originally designed it. And again, working our way around to the posterior teeth, trimming back and sealing just to the height of contour. As a final step, we cut back the pallet, again extending just beyond the original design line, which was transferred onto the duplicate model. We seal this area, then join the pallet to the buckle flanges previously waxed. Once again, it is important to recognize that the use of prefabricated patterns for the waxing not only allows you to expedite the procedure from the standpoint of improved production, but also to create such a perfect wax up that the amount of time it takes to finish the appliance will be minimized. Generally, flexible resins are not as quick and easy to finish and grind as acrylics. It would be important to maximize efficiency by creating all the finished forms in waxing rather than in finishing. The technique that we are illustrating here is appropriate for Valplast flexible partials. For other brands of flexible materials, the exact thickness that is recommended may vary from manufacturer to manufacturer. In general, a similar technique will apply. Wax to the final anatomical formations and uniform thicknesses. We have just seen the section on preparation for a flexible partial denture. The preparatory steps, again, are the most critical in assuring the patient's satisfaction and positive experience with their flexible partial denture. Once again, very important points to remember. The blocking and relieving are critical for the patient's comfort. And the technique followed in waxing is critical not just for the simplicity and efficiency of finishing, but also for the proper thickness and fit of the final partial. The injection process. In this section, we'll cover the processing of a flexible partial denture. This includes the use of machinery that is necessary for melting or otherwise preparing the material itself for injection into a flask. The waxed case has been invested in the specially designed flask. Different manufacturers of flexible resins have somewhat differing flasks or flasking techniques. These techniques illustrated here are flasking for the Valplast system. The common principle is that the closed flask method of injection is used on all the systems. So there must be invested sprue formations in the upper half of the flask. The teeth are held in the investment in the top half, either through the formation of the investment itself or preferably using some type of adhesive. The adhesive used should not be a cyanoacrylate based as these superglue adhesives distort and deform the surfaces of the teeth. Once the wax is eliminated through the boil-out and wash-out procedure, the flask will be painted with a tinfoil substitute or separating medium. 
With the Valplast system, the flask is ready for injection once it cools gradually to room temperature. Other systems may recommend different procedures as far as injection temperature of the flask. At this point, we can close up the flask and prepare the flask for injection. The Valplast material is injected after a melting time of 10 minutes in the specially designed furnace. The flask is positioned under the press. After the melting time, the cylinder is withdrawn from the furnace, placed in position over the flask, and the cartridge is compressed so that all the material is injected into the flask. We have just seen the steps used to process a flexible partial denture. The machinery used may vary from manufacturer to manufacturer. What we reviewed just now is the machinery and procedure used for Valplast flexible partials. Finishing. In this section, we will review finishing and polishing of a flexible partial denture. The important points to observe here are that the techniques differ somewhat from the techniques you use in finishing an acrylic denture. Pay close attention to the selection of abrasives and also the movement of the contact point between the appliance itself and the abrasive that's used. In polishing, it's important to note that there are really four stages in polishing for a flexible partial denture. The compounds that are used will be different from those used for acrylic, although we have found that the compounds used for flexible partial dentures do work very well on acrylic as well. The first step will be to cut the sprue using the fiber cutter. We'll be grinding down the sprue areas and other protruding segments with the diamond cap. Outer surface finishing can be done with the pink grinding film. Interior surfaces can be relieved to accommodate insertion path issues with the vulcanite or tungsten steel burr. The outer surface does have to be prepared for polishing as a final stage using the reddish brown rubber wheel. After the surface is entirely rubberized, we'll use an Abbott Robinson brush to clean up the surface before we proceed to polishing. The knife which you see pictured here is a very useful tool to clean up necklines of the teeth. And depending on how the blade is shaped, it is also useful to remove small fibers that might protrude from the edge of the appliance after finishing is complete. We keep the honing stone handy so that we can reshape all the instruments as needed along the way in finishing to create a sharper edge or round off the surfaces to get the desired results. Polishing. First step in polishing is application of the pumice. We recommend the use of an extra coarse pumice. The second stage is application of brown Tripoli compound. The partial must be dipped in cool water frequently during the application of the compound to avoid excess buildup of heat on the surface. After the Tripoli compound, we clean the surface with a clean B20 brush. 
and we see an exhibited deep shine in the partial already at this stage. The final stage is application of a high polish compound, first at a slow speed and then briefly at a high speed with very light pressure. This brings out the high gloss on the surface. The finished case is packaged in water. This prevents dehydration of the surface, which can cause tension on the surface, distorting the shape and the position of the material. Once again, it is important to note that the techniques used in finishing a flexible partial acrylic, the most important area of difference is in the movement of the contact point between the abrasive and the appliance itself.